but, and Ola couldn't see them. He couldn't see them. He said that eventually, uh, no question down about it, that the right wing will throw out the dissident elements called the militants. The militants. As Cannon said, he couldn't understand why they called themselves that. But they, that's what they call themselves. And we'll analyze them in a few minutes. Or also, uh, by this time, started to develop the concept in 1935 as a, that it was a matter of principle that under no condition does the Revolutionary Party take its banner and uh, pull down its banner and surrender to another enemy organization. And the answer was that uh, he was correct, 100%. The only thing is that, world, that Trotskyism in the United States is not a political party. It's only a small propaganda group. Secondly, it was explained to him that we weren't going into the Socialist Party to become disciples of Norman Thomas or Hillman or, or, or Dubinsky or, or Hillquit. That we were going in to perform a political task as I said before, the workers weren't coming into the, into the Trotskyist movement in this country because these two big obstacles were blocking our road. They couldn't see us because they saw the Communist Party and they saw the Socialist Party. And the question comes down, as Cannon has, has repeatedly said time and time again, the important thing about politics is to know what to do next. You can have the correct program, all the correct programs from here to hell. You can have the best propagandists in the world putting out good newspapers, magazines, participating in all kinds of actions. But if you don't know what to do next, you might just as well retire and quit. And that was what the American Trotskyist movement had come to that stage. What to do next? Exist as a, as a, as a small, nice, pure, and holy organization that wasn't going to dirty its hands by mixing with these dirty old socialists. <coughs> or would they go into this organization and become a left wing in it, break down the organizational barriers between the ranks of the Socialist Party and Trotskyism, and unite with them and sooner or later lay down the gauntlet to the right wingers? That was the question. Now, Ola couldn't see that, and uh, he raised hell inside the Trotskyist movement, and cul it culminated in July of 1935, yeah, in 1935, where he, uh, where the, the question for the first time was discussed at a plenum of the Workers' Party. And it was at this time that a caucus was organized by the Cannon Shockman grouping who were for entrance into the Socialist Party if conditions warranted it. They weren't for entrance into the Socialist Party, by no means, not at that time. It was a question of keeping an eye on the Socialist Party, and if conditions did warrant it, we should enter it. And that's how the that resolution that was adopted at that time, or wasn't adopted, but that was the way the resolution of the Cannon Shocking Group uh, was written. All, on the other hand, said it was a matter of principle. As I said last week, he repeated until he was blue in the face, the fact that Rosa Luxemburg had said the Second International was a stinking corpse in 1940. <clears throat> now, under the impact of world events, this grouping inside the Socialist Party, called the Militants, started to, to talk really radical. They were, a, they were led by a pack of schoolboys uh, in their thirties, uh, young fellows who would, and girls who would get out of school, got their sheepskin, and. Uh, Join the ranks of the unemployed with any jobs for anybody in the 30s for the love of Pete. And the first thing you know, these people were talking against people's frontism. That's a good sign. They were talking for the dictatorship of the proletariat. They were against the Second International, but not for the Fourth. They were against the Second International. And they were looking for a revolutionary road. Well, what do you do in such a case? Do you say to them, look at I'm the guy that you should unite with. Why don't you quit the Socialist Party and join me? They say, well, they, well, who's that guy that's talking like that? They couldn't even see us. We were so small. And that's what they told us. They said, well, you're, you people are, you don't amount to anything. And lots of them said, well, Trotsky's right. Oh, sure, Trotsky's right. Every dope knows that, for Christ's sake. 
But you guys aren't accomplishing anything. You're isolated. Why don't you join the party? The party meant the social party. That's what the hell they felt in those days. And after the, uh, the settling of the accounts with the Olerites in, in uh, November of 1935, where they uh, fragrantly broke discipline by distributing, they demanded a paper of their own. Of course, every faction does that when they're ready to quit. They started, they, they started to distribute their propaganda at public meetings of the Trotskyists. And uh, in the celebration of the first anniversary of the founding of the Workers' Party, they distributed thick bulletins explain how uh, Trotsky was selling out. Cannon is just an errand boy for Trotsky, he's selling out, and so forth and so on, and warning the American Trotskyists of how they were going to be uh, uh, led by Norman Thomas if they didn't watch their step. Well, he, Trotsky, Oler and his gang were expelled at that time. They took uh, probably uh, a third of the organization. It's safe to say that uh, 75% of the elements that Ola took were workers. Not petty bourgeois elements, they were workers. And that's one thing we have to get into our head. That it isn't just the petty bourgeois elements that, that revolt against the program of the party, that the workers revolt too. The workers aren't the same uh, uh, today as they were 10 years ago. The workers are joining the party. And they're influenced and pushed around by class pressures. And the result was that Ola took about a third of the organization. Mainly trade unionists, a few trade union contacts that the American Trotskyist movement had outside of the Minneapolis and the uh, Toledo uh, comrades. To make it short and sweet, Olerism uh, took the entire Detroit branch of the Trotskyist movement, 100%. They were in on the ground floor in the great ground swell that created the, uh, the United Automobile Workers in 1936-37. But they carried their sectarianism right into the trade union movement. This idea of fighting for a quarter raise, the uh, hell with that. We should get a dollar raise uh, instead, of, uh, instead of yelling for a, a, a paid vacation. We should get a month's vacation and all these ridiculous demands. And it finally ended with them being driven out of the leadership of the local unions that they founded and led in the city of Detroit. Uh, you comrades read a notice in our paper here about a month ago in obituary to uh, a man named Saul. I remember him when he was thrown down the stairs and out of the union that he was the president of in Detroit. But his, he, uh, his ultra-radicalism ultra had so infuriated the rank and file of his union and gave, him, and gave the, the, uh, <coughs> the, the right wingers <coughs> so much ammunition that they could use physical force against him and his comrades and throw them bodily out of the damn union that they had founded and, and led. That's the, the sickness of sectarianism. And eventually, uh, uh, Olerism uh, went through the typical uh, splits that take part in all these uh, uh, sectarian organizations that have split off from the Fourth International. One after the other. They had one split after the other. They ended up uh, uh, gone with the wind. They don't exist today, of course. But in order to carry out this line, of going into the Socialist Party meant another factional struggle inside the Trotskyist movement. Now that Ola was gone, the groundwork was uh, laid for some kind of a political discussion and political understanding of what was our task next. The party had got rid of the sectarians because it was absolutely necessary. It was necessary to have a split. It was progressive. Why was it progressive? Gis Cannon says, splits and unities are necessary for the development of the revolutionary movement. We had to have a split at this time because how could we enter the Socialist Party if we had, say, one-third or one-fourth of the members going into the Socialist Party, carrying on a whispering campaign, Norman Thomas is a faker, uh, you're talking with some workers and socialist workers that work in your factory, now your comrades are theirs. You're no longer, the, the organizational barrier has been smashed. And now you're comrades of these members in the Socialist Party who work in the same factory with you. How could you make any progress there if there was some screwball saying, what the hell are you fooling around those monkeys? What are you, they're Norman Thomas followers for Christ's sake. You couldn't do any work. How could you do any work if, uh, if when Norman Thomas ran for president in 1936? We were the main driving force in that political campaign. 
What could you do if you had all of them on saying, what the hell are you nominating? What are you breaking your back weight and trying to get votes off for that jerk? Don't you know he's a, a reformist? Whisper to you, a reformist. No kidding. We went into the, we, uh, in other words, you had to get rid of all the before you could do any effective work inside the socialist party. And that was accomplished by them being thrown out and expelled in November 1935. But that didn't clear up the problem. By this time, Musty conceived of the idea that the, that the Workers' Party was a, a permanent creation. And he developed a fixation that the, we shouldn't dissolve the Workers' Party. Yeah, it's very important to uh, fool around with the Socialist Party, but he couldn't bring himself to make that next step to liquidate the organization and enter as a body into the Socialist Party. And he was prompted, you might say, as well as, as urged on into this position by a grouping inside the party that was not a faction, but a clique. Now, there's a difference between a faction and a clique. A faction marches under a program and uh, fights openly for that program. But this grouping, led by a man named Martin Aburn, one of the founders of American Trotskyism, carried on its campaign on a clique basis, never had any political program, never in all its existence from the early 1930s until it was, uh, went with Shockman in 1940, never had any political program of any nature whatsoever. They had only one concept in their ideology, if you want to call it, not, call it an ideology, and that was Cannon's a bastard. That's all. Cannon is a bastard. And how was he a bastard? Well, anybody in this world knows that, that the members of, of, of our, of that our pals will say, instead of saying our clique, that our pals are the most talented people in the world. If you don't believe me, ask Joe. I say he's the most brilliant man in the world, and he says I'm the most brilliant man in the world. That was about their proof of their brilliance. Um, it's, it's a fantastic thing. I was thinking about coming over to the meeting today. These people were utterly incompetent. They didn't have any talents whatsoever. And no talent, none of them, none of them. Abraham himself was no speaker. He was no organizer. He was no writer. And he was no inspirer of an individual in a personal conversation. And you go down the whole goddamn list of them. They were, a large section of the main core of them were petty bourgeois elements that for some peculiar reason thought they did have talents, but they had no talents whatsoever. And they believed that Cannon was their main obstacle to them displaying their fine feathers, I guess they call them. And this grouping was held together through internal gossip. The political committee could meet as you know, in, in, the, in democratic centralism, the top leadership of the party, elected by convention, has the responsibility of running the party. And that top committee of the party is under the discipline of the committee itself. And what goes on in the committee is nobody's business. No one's business. <coughs> that's the, Democrat, that's the, the centralist side of Leninism. Well, in these... Abram was always on the political committee of the Trotskyist movement. As Cannon said, he made no contribution whatsoever. He was uh, accepted by the rest of the members of the political committee as a lightweight. But he was put on there with the idea of keeping an eye on him. Whenever you're in such a situation as that, it's always good the organizational procedure to put him or her on the committee so you can watch them. And if you watch them close enough, you can tell what they're, what they're, what they're going to do tomorrow. Now, this, this gang was held together. It was a national grouping. It was held together by Aburn distributing throughout the grouping all over the country all the inside dope on what was going on in the political committee. It sounds fantastic, but that's, I have the document up the house that, uh, that uh, documents the uh, development of the Aburn clique. Sending letters morning, noon, and night. They were, that's the one thing they did. They were very capable letter writers. And uh, there's no doubt about it that they were, uh, there was something wrong with them mentally. Because in these letters they talk about I. Lucky I was there, I saved the situation. Uh, 
the national office is in an awful jam, and it's only for me that the, that the Trotskyist movement is being saved in this country. Those are the kind of letters that Abram wrote. Out of this world. But this grouping was held together by this gossip, and the fact that Cannon was the main obstacle against Marty Abram, proving to the whole entire world and forever to posterity forever that he was a far superior person even, I guess, than Count Marx himself. He was a fool. Well, they shimmied up to Musty and poisoned them and explained how Cannon was trying to wiggle us into the Socialist Party without anybody knowing it. Now, Abern and his group were not opposed to the French turn. They never took positions on any political question. They weren't opposed. They, went to, they kept their ear to the ground to find out how, what Trotsky was thinking, and then they would propose to, to, to propound Trotsky's theories and his ideas. Now, they were for the French turn, for instance, into the Socialist Party under given conditions and so forth. And they entered into a block with Musty, who was opposed to going into the Socialist Party, completely unprincipled. One is for and one is against. But that was only a minor detail as far as Abram was concerned. The main thing was that this grouping was opposed to Cannon, and that was all they were interested in. Now, during this period of time, Musty's, one of Musty's strongholds was in Allentown, Pennsylvania, where we had a branch of about 40 members. And there were all kinds of queer going-ons down there, particularly in the unemployed movement, where our comrades, where the branch was split in half, of course, because of the carrying-ons, uh, half of them supporting the, uh, the line laid down by the political committee, and the other half uh, following some kind of a strange line that, uh, that was very partial to Stalinism, because the Stalinists had a big unemployed organization too, but not in Allentown. And over a period of weeks and months, the reports kept getting back into New York that the Stalinists were penetrating, their influence was penetrating the Allentown branch. And Cannon and his supporters tried to call a halt to this in the, through the political committee. But Musty always stood against it. He stood in between. That is, in between step settling accounts with the Allentown uh, uh, pro-Stalinist wing of, of, of the branch down there, and the Trotskyists led by Cannon. On the basis that they have to learn for, uh, uh, through experience, and a lot of it is just plain gossip and exaggerations and so forth and so on. Musty was supporting his friends, in other words, down in Allentown. He was supporting them against the correct line of the Trotskyist movement and indirectly supporting enemies of the Workers' Party. This, of course, is, uh, is completely unprincipled, and it was an unprincipled politics based on subjectivism, on the attempt to fight Cannon whom he suspected of wanting to liquidate the Workers' Party into the Socialist Party. And he was supported in this treachery by uh, Aburn. And lo and behold, this whole thing came to a head at the convention of the Trotskyists in April of 1936, where we made a decision to join the Socialist Party. Cannon and Shockman had carried on a struggle of preparing the ranks of the party to enter the Socialist Party if conditions warranted it. And conditions started to warm up in December of 1935 when Hillquit, that is the Amalgamated Clothing Workers, Dubinsky, that is the, Amalga the International Lady Government Workers, decided to cut out all this phony playing around with socialism and getting down to business and becoming statesmen in the Democratic Party. So they quit the Socialist Party when they found out that the militants had, the, had, the, had control of the New York organization. Well, now the Socialist Party was an entirely different setup. It might have been necessary for the Trotskyists to enter even if Hillman and them had remained. But now that they were out of the way, it meant that the militants had a complete free hand inside the Socialist Party. The reactionary elements had walked out of the party. The Jewish Bund 
which was the backbone of reaction inside the Socialist Party, walked out of the Socialist Party and left it to these young, inexperienced uh, uh, elements that for some reason or other thought that they were leading, leading leaders and socialists. Well, when this happened, Hannon and Schachman immediately oriented towards the Socialist Party entrance. And they did it by introducing a resolution into the political committee of the party, calling a meeting of the National Committee to, to uh, discuss the question, and from there proceeding to a national convention which okayed the entrance into the Socialist Party. Now, at this convention, I'll never forget it, the first day it was called to order, the Daily Worker came out with the announcement that three prominent Trotskyists, Johnson, you know that dope Arnold Johnson, ex-guy pilot, a man named Halleck and another named Reich from Allentown had quit the Trotskyist movement and joined the Stalinist party. This was a terrific blow to Musty because he had been warned and warned and warned that Stalinism was penetrating into the Allentown branch and that some of his friends were preparing to, to uh, betray the party and join the, the Communist Party. And it was a terrific lesson, of course, in unprincipled politics. And clickism propounded by Abernism, which was also peddled to Musty, that a good click, a good personal friendship business is much better than building a revolutionary party based on principles, political principles. Now, when the, when the militants took over the, the control of the Socialist Party, they issued a big manifesto signed by Norman Thomas, you know, that old hardened revolutionary. And they called, they, they explained how, they, how the, uh, the, uh, these political fakers had left the Socialist Party and now they were going to build the revolutionary party in the United States and we urge all serious workers and intellectuals to come and join the Socialist Party and help us build this party. Well, the Trotsky guy said, hey, that sounds pretty good. We'll be over to see you tomorrow. And that's exactly what happened. This terrified them. They had, in, in their uh, exuberance over uh, they, these right wingers walking out, they had uh, overreached themselves by issuing such a welcome. And they never expected the Trotskyists to say, yeah, well, we'll be over there tomorrow morning. So they said, oh, wait a second, wait a second. They wouldn't allow us to join as an organization. We had to join as individuals. There was no welcoming to us. They didn't put it in their paper that the Trotskyists had going to liquidate and join, the, the social, join them in building the Revolutionary Party. Nothing at all. There was no publicity whatsoever. And above everything else, there was no post at all. No post at all for any of the Trotskyists joining the Socialist Party. Imagine a man like Cannon, not even given a post, not to mention other comrades, but uh, no post whatsoever. The Congress of Minneapolis that had just engaged in a great trade union struggle, never even recognized. That's how contemptuous and how frightened, frightened, that's what it was, how frightened that these individuals were who were the so-called leaders of the militants. They wanted us because they knew that we could take care of the Stalinists who were putting the pressure on them to liquidate and join the Communist Party. They knew we had all the answers. So they welcomed us on that basis. Well, what was the Socialist Party like? When we joined it, we found out that it was a hollow shell. A hollow shell. They had all kinds of great pretensions. Uh, state organizations, you know, and so forth. Uh, in Massachusetts, they had a couple of thousand members. Well, if you were Jesus Christ, you wouldn't have been able to find them. They had 600 youth. 600 youth members, members of the Young Socialist, Young People's Socialist uh, League. You know what these 600 were? They were members of the Finnish, Finnish Federation up in the Garden of Mass. They knew no more about socialism than, uh, than the man on the moon. But this was the hangover of the old federations, uh, these foreign federations that were brought over from the old country uh, by the Finnish workers, the Jewish workers, the Slavic workers of all the different uh, uh, nationalities and so forth. Belgian Federation. They, all these federations existed throughout the United States, which was a reflection of the immigration that poured into the United States. 
So up there, they had 600 members in the youth. Well, in Boston, they had, uh, oh, probably a dozen. And another dozen, uh, nine of them didn't know why they were in the Socialist Party. So you could, the, the, you would take an example, the young socialists, these young socialists, our comrades, uh, who, who were the young socialists uh, grouping in the city here, in, in the state, they could uh, carry all the work they wanted and do all the construction, uh, constructive work of building the Socialist Party. But when it came to really setting up the state organization, in came one of these young ward healers from Pittsburgh and said, uh, here's my 600 votes. They, they voted in the block. They didn't vote individually. He said, yeah, I represent 600 votes, and I guess I'll be the secretary this coming term. And uh, Hamo Tamo, you know these names the Finns have, he'll be the organizational secretary. Well, who's he? Oh, he's a, he belongs up in Dallas. Well, we never see him. Oh, he doesn't come. Well, that's the way the organization was. Well, that's where a picture of it throughout the whole country. Except in some of the big industrial centers, this, the Socialist Party had membership. The Automobile Workers Union, the Steel Union, uh, on the waterfront even, and so on. And uh, in no time, these workers came to our, uh, to our uh, ideology, as well as to our comradeship, you might say. Now, when we entered the Socialist Party, <coughs> there was a line laid down on how to proceed. Don't go into the Socialist Party, and when not when, when in, the United, in Massachusetts here, a man a very poor man was the secretary, Alpha Baker Lewis, poor bastard, only had 10, 20 million dollars. He used the Socialist Party as an organization to run around, fool around with girls. And he had illegitimate kids all over the state, and in Rhode Island, too. Well, we were told, don't go in there, and, and when this guy puts out his hand, how are your comrades? Said, oh, for Christ's sake, get away. No. You we weren't interested in Alpha Baker Lewis, we were interested in some of the rank and file of his organization. That's what we were interested in. So we shook hands with Alpha. How are you, Comrade Baker? Then afterwards you wiped your hand. <laughs> but that's where you play the game. He put me on his payroll at ten bucks a week to do organizational work down in Lynn. And some of these other guys, though, the, uh, the old socialists, they were bleeding them for forty and fifty bucks a week as organizers. Christ, he didn't give money, meant nothing to him, of course. Well, that's what we entered with a, with a, on a friendly basis to the rank and file as well as to the leadership. We were going in there to do a political job. That's what we were going in for, not to show how smart we were or, or that we were super Bolsheviks or anything of that nature. No attacks on the leadership. Work with the rank and file. That's what we were told to do. And become the best members of the Socialist Party. Now just think of that, become the best member of the Socialist Party. What did that mean? The best bootlickers for Norman Thomas? Of course not. Prove to the rank and file that you're interested in that you want to build a Socialist Party because this is their party. And after they see that you're really plugging and you're doing your bit, then you can talk to them because you've broken down the organizational barrier and you have their confidence. We didn't go into the Socialist Party, I remember down in Lynn there, we didn't, we didn't go in there and say, uh, Oh, hey, what was that you said? Caballero is the Lenin of Spain? For crazy, he's a phony the four dollar bill. No, we didn't say that. We just said, yeah, yeah, I guess so. The hell, we don't look for an argument. We said to ourselves, we are settled with you about six months from now, brother. And that's exactly what we did. We ran the election campaign for Norman's for the Socialist Party in, in that in the Middlesex County, is it where they belong? Essex County? We ran the public meeting for Norman Thomas and so forth. We were the socialists. There was only about 40 of us in the state, not even that. But we, ran, we were the socialist party in the state here. And we proved to the, to the rank and file elements, there were only a couple dozen of them, we proved to them that we meant business and we weren't in your party to split it. And the result was that when we did get thrown out, they came with us because they saw that we knew what we were doing and that we had entered the party in good faith, whereas these militants had uh, double-crossed us. And we'll explain that. Now, side by side with this, even with the, it shows you how, how the working class and, and uh, uh, socialists in general are affected by international events. Oh, the Spanish Civil War wasn't uh, more than six months old. 
wasn't more than six months old, when an experienced Marxist could say, it's hopeless. It's a terrible goddamn thing. These workers are just fighting for nothing. The Stalinists took over the revolution, which meant they were going to crush it. But it's clear today, of course. You come and can, uh, can say, oh, sure, hell, anybody know the Stalinists would do that. But not in 1936. Don't forget, Stalinism was only feeling its oats. And in the eyes of the great masses of workers, Stalinism was the revolutionary movement. But Trotsky had educated us uh, through his writings and his, his books and so forth to the fact that socialism in one country meant exactly that. Socialism in one country, dash, and no other. So that, uh, that, that had a big effect on the, uh, on the minds of, the, of revolutionary workers. The terrible thing that happened in France, where the French workers, in, in, in collaboration with this small, petty bourgeois party, had, got a, had, had accomplished a big electoral victory, only to uh, be told, uh, uh, you don't know when to win strikes, brother. This had a big effect on radical workers. Working workers all the kind of all the time express their thoughts and their, and their uh, ideas and so forth, but they can feel it. <coughs> and a demoralization started to set in. Then to add everything to this came the famous Moscow trials, where Stalinism uh, killed off uh, the remnants of, uh, of Lenin's party. All the revolutionary leaders and comrades of Lenin were wiped out and executed under the most horrible uh, conditions possible. Well, these, these events had a big effect on the American working class, and you could sense that there was a wave of reaction starting in. Uh, from 1929 up to this time, there had been a wave of radicalism. But now, it was just the opposite. The big upheavals in the trade union movement came in 36 and 37, and by 1937 they were spent. It was, now it was only sporadic. The, trade, the political movement was on the downgrade, the socialist and communist parties. And side by side with this came our troubles inside the Socialist Party. Under the, uh, the, the uh, wave of reaction came to the surface all the doubts and all the hesitations of these so-called militants. We said it with the, the, the uh, trip into the Socialist Party, no question doubt about it, helped uh, the American Trotskyist movement in uh, uh, the fight to against the Moscow uh, trials. We set up a Trotsky defense committee that had international connections. We rallied uh, the cream of the liberals, the real liberals, not the phonies, the real liberals in this country to a defense of Trotsky and, and, uh, and uh, Lenin's collaborators against world Stalinism. Now when we went in, I, meant, I forgot to mention that when we went in the Socialist Party, one of the precautions that was taken by these fakers these so-called militants that took over the party, one of the precautions they took that they figured they would pull our teeth out was they forbid us to have our newspaper. We had our no, no newspaper. Not only that, but they said you have to give up your magazine too. Now these were terrible blows. Didn't Lenin tell us that the newspaper is the national organizer of the party? That's why we have a newspaper. Not because we like it. Not because we like to pay the deficit every week going running into hundreds of dollars. No, we have it because we recognize that's the chief organizer of the party. It pulls it together and gives it a national stature. And it's the propaganda wing of the party. And uh, we had to uh, throw this into the waste pan, the, the uh, waste bucket. It had been traditional in the socialist movement, the socialist party, that any state organization could have a pie paper of its own. But not when the Trotsky said, oh, not you guys. So we had to discontinue the paper. We had to discontinue the magazine. Well, you can imagine if Hugo Ola was still in our party at that time. He said, didn't I tell you? Cannon's betraying you. Cannon's ready to sell out. Look, at he's ready to give up the paper. He's ready to give up the magazine. You guys are going to end up whooping it up for Norman Thomas and the Second International. No, we went, to, we went into the socialist party. Cannon explained, we got a bigger job to do than just worrying about the militant. Don't worry, we'll find a way to talk. And we did. When we entered the Socialist Party, Albert Goldman, who had entered the Socialist Party uh, a year ahead of us, started a little mimeograph paper in Chicago called the Socialist Appeal. And an understanding was reached with him 
before we entered the Socialist Party, that he would put this little mimeograph paper at our service. And uh, after a while, uh, this little mimeograph paper suddenly became a four-page printed paper. And after a while, it, instead of a tabloid, it became a full-length regular newspaper. Well, now the leaders of this so-called uh, militant gang were as follows. My notes are mixed up here. Did you, you, you come with never heard of a guy named Gus Tyler? He uh, was the chief altar boy for Dubinsky in the uh, in the International Aid Government Workers Union. He became, shortly after we got thrown out of the Socialist Party, he became educational director of the International Aid Government Workers Union. This guy was a very excellent platform speaker. Excellent. He could grasp uh, all kinds of revolutionary ideas uh, with a snap of the finger. And when, when, we, when we were in the Socialist Party, we used him as the chief battering ram in the name of Trotskyism, to fight the Stalinists when we could get them onto the platform for a debate. And as Cannon says in his book, this young guy could uh, quote Lenin backwards and forwards. The only trouble he had of being a revolutionary was he only lacked character, that's all. He came to a dance of ours after the war broke out. I was in New York at that time, 1939. And you know, we opposed the war right from the first shot. This guy's at a dance with the Trotskyists. And I knew him. So uh, when he wanted to shake hands with me, I wouldn't shake hands with him. And he said, oh, I suppose you're one of these guys that's mad because I'm for the war. I said, that just didn't mean anything to him. Well, that was one of the great leaders of the militants. Then we had another guy named Porter. You come with the two young, you weren't working during the Second World War. If you did, you'd curse this guy. He was on the war labor board. He became a Democrat, Roosevelt guy. Then you heard of anti Andy Bumula, the great congressman from uh, from Wisconsin, Democratic Party congressman. He was another great leader of the socialists. Oh, then there was another guy, Jack Altman, who was the brains, the organizational brains in the fight against us. He became the business agent of, of national business agent of the. Oh, I don't know, what do you call it? Bookkeepers Union or clerks or some damn thing like that. In other words, the whole gang of them ended up, after, the, after they had purged the Socialist Party of, of Socialism, good, let's get rid of the Trotskyists, they all took trade union jobs, or they went over openly to the Democratic Party and became hacks for Franklin Delano Roosevelt. The leader of the unemployed movement, David Lasser, got a big job down in Washington. Uh, Joe Lash, Got a big job with Eleanor, Eleanor Roosevelt, I never hear what the hell it was, but in the governmental setup, the whole gang of them. And I think Lash has just scribbled a book about Eleanor Roosevelt. But these were the guys that for some strange reason, as Cannon says, call themselves militants. He said he was never able to understand why they ever considered themselves leaders, much less being militant leaders. <coughs> now, under the work of the rank and file Trotskyists, the rank-and-file workers of the Socialist Party came over to the concept of the Fourth International and Trotskyism. And they looked to the Trotskyists, the left wing of the Socialist Party. By this time, we were known as the left wing. Not the left wing like the militants were, with a lot of uh, uh, no program. Uh, or if they did have a program, it was a half-baked program that said yes and no on both sides of every question. No, we threw, when we organized our caucus, called the, the, I forget what we didn't, I don't know what the hell, the Socialist Appeal Caucus. We organized it on a program, on a program calling for the Fourth International, not a new international, a Fourth International, calling on a program of uncompromising class struggle, calling on a program of no, no endorsing bourgeois politicians. When the convention came up of 1937, the Socialist Party National Committee met and made a new rule. You have to be in the party four years before you can be a delegate. See, they changed the rules as they, as they went along when they realized that they represented nobody. We represent, we had the Socialist Party in our hip pocket. 
And if things were run fairly and squarely, we would have taken over the party at that convention, no doubt about it. Well, this was a notice to the Trotskyists that your days are numbered. Well, we raised holy heck over the different decisions they made in our paper, The Socialist Appeal. So they had another meeting of the National Committee which forbid any state organizations to have newspapers of their own. There was only one newspaper, that was The Socialist Appeal. That's what they meant. So The Socialist Appeal had to liquidate. It didn't liquidate because it wanted to, and we didn't liquidate it because we had our job done. There was still some more work to do. That is, there were still some militants laying around, militant workers laying around that we hadn't uh, brought over 100% to us yet. So that now that they liquidated our paper on us, shut us off from being delegates to their convention, we had to operate through a new method of letter writing. That is, the political committee would send out a letter to different individuals in different localities signed in the name of not the political committee but the name of one comrade because we weren't supposed to have an organization at all and this would lay down the line on what to do and how to do the final blow up came when LaGuardia the famous mayor of New York City a democratic demagogue but an able man ran for, ma for re-election of mayor of New York City and Norman Thomas and the Socialist Party leadership endorsed him well, we had pushed through the convention, even though we had no delegates. We pushed through, through friends, a new law in the Socialist Party saying that the Socialist Party cannot endorse any bourgeois candidates. And hardly did the convention make that decision when Norman Thomas says, uh, I endorse, uh, what's his name, LaGuardia. Flower LaGuardia, or whatever his name was. Didn't, see, in other words, decisions in the Socialist Party weren't worth the paper they were written on. The, the big wigs did as they goddamn well pleased and they took all kinds of measures against left wingers that's always been the history of every reformist organization you can lay it down as a law while well, we raised the devil about this and this was a real concrete issue a principle this was a, a, a an issue that you could rally revolutionary workers against they didn't want to go out and whoop it up for any capitalist candidate and the result was that was the showdown <coughs> and uh, when that came they started to expel various comrades in New York City, and they picked on Massachusetts next. They did it just through uh, the formality of having a statewide meeting and then telling you to scram, that's all. There was no debating. How could you debate with the multimillionaires, uh, all kinds of screwy uh, uh, sky pilots, uh, tin horn uh, 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 union bureaucrats on the make, chicken farmers in Massachusetts, a couple of them were chicken farmers, and so forth, what the hell, all they did was, uh, we just tipped our hat and said goodbye, that's about it. But we didn't recognize these expulsions either, because well, we wanted to do a job on the Socialist Party, so we set up an organization called the Committee of the Expelled Branches, and we brought out the Socialist Appeal, of course, back into the old style, made it a full-size newspaper, and opened up a, a deadly campaign against the leadership of the Socialist Party uh, that uh, they didn't survive. Now we start taking the count on what happened from this uh, great tactical maneuver that was led by Comrade Cannon, under the advice of Comrade Trotsky, of course, because Cannon was in touch with Trotsky all the time. That's one thing about Cannon. Makes no secret of it that before he did anything, he always contacted Trotsky. And as he said before, that he doesn't like an organization with one brilliant leader, two leaders are better, three leaders are better, four leaders are better. But if there's only one, he'll do business with that man. And uh, Trotsky was of the opinion, now you gotta get out. And it was under his guidance, carried out by Comrade Cannon, that we quit the Socialist Party and went into business for ourselves. Now we take an accounting. While we're in the Socialist Party, we made all kinds of, I might say, in Boston at least, up until we went in the Socialist Party, we were isolated. We didn't know the first goddamn thing about mass work or, or you know, how to, how to make connections and friends and so forth. We came out of the Socialist Party, we had a, we had a whole liberal periphery that we, could, that we could talk to, that we met while we were in the Socialist Party. Uh, we met all kinds of trade union connections and so forth and so on. And this happened all over the country. Uh, while we were in the Socialist Party, we built our trade, our maritime fraction, starting out on the West Coast. 
where Cannon was on a very uh, uh, personal and friendly basis with Harry Lumberg, due to the fact that Lumberg was an old wobbly. And we started to penetrate the maritime industry, culminating in 1945 and 6, where we had 125, 130 comrades that were sa sailors in the maritime industry. <coughs> we made terrific headway in the automobile union. We've been wiped out when oil quit the party, leaving us with not one single member in Detroit. We rebuilt a branch in Detroit, and we had comrades in the various big plants that, throughout the auto industry in Detroit, in Flint, uh, Hermit, Herman, uh, Hermit Johnson came out, Kermit Johnson came over to us, the man that founded the, uh, the uh, UAW in Local 699, I think it's called, Chevy Local in, uh, in Flint, Michigan. We had connections in steel and so forth, up and down the line. And above everything else, the Trotskyist movement started to get proletarianized. That was a main, that was one of the main things, main accomplishments. <coughs> because up to this time, the party was... Uh, Overwhelming, you, you might say, uh, uh, petty bourgeois elements. But we picked up enough workers and so forth and colonized enough workers that the class content of the Trotskyist movement started to change over to proletarianization. We had our convention in January 1st, 1938, and the Socialist Workers' Party was founded. Had that convention in Chicago. We took the count and we find out we had 15, 1,600 members. We were in the Socialist Party uh, by the wildest stretch of the imagination, we probably had 300 members when we were in the Socialist Party. And we came up with that with 15, 1600. Now, that didn't mean that these 15, 1600 uh, members that came out of the Socialist Party were 100% uh, were, uh, Trotskyists, by no means. And uh, under the pressure of reaction that started a gallop at this time, many of these elements uh, recognized the fact that they made a bad mistake by joining the Trotskyists, and uh, they quit between 1938 and the time that the Shockman business broke out in 39. But the interesting thing is this, drawing the balance sheet. Now, Hugo Waller uh, was going to be pure and holy. He wasn't going to get his hands, hands dirty fooling around with these renegade socialists. When we take the balance sheet, we find out that Hugo Waller didn't, en didn't enlist one single socialist in his organization. He remained pure and holy, and nobody listened to him. And he remained to himself as a, a good sectarian, and instead of gaining members, the organization split down the middle, and he and Stam went at each other's throats. Stam was the co-leader of the organization. The program that we adopted in Chicago was the program that we have today, the program of World Trotskyism. Did we accomplish our task of taking the militants out of the Socialist Party? We took 100 percent. The, the Socialist Party, after 1938, remained nothing but a skeleton organization. That's what it is today. From 19, they've never wrote, written, they've never run another election campaign on a national scale after 1938. In other words, we took the young blood out of it that. Uh, they used to build their organization, that did their legwork for them. Now we can draw another balance sheet to the work and the experiences that we had in the Socialist Party. See, there's no use going through experiences unless you learn. If you can't learn from experiences, then you'll never make a, a, a real uh, Leninist, by no means. One thing, we learned from all of what? Never split from the mainstream. Is that right? Ola was a very capable man, no question done about it. Highly respected by Jim Cannon as a real trade union organizer. Then he went into the political field and made a fool of himself. Split from the main current and ended up in the dung heap of, of revolutionary politics. You don't split from the main current, which is the World Trotskyist Movement, that's what I'm talking of in this sense. Will Trotsky's movement represent the cream of the crop? And if you can't convince them of the correctness of your program, how are you going to correct the, the hillbillies? The typical American worker that thinks that, the, that the, the Democratic Party or the Republican Party is the real party of the working people. If you can't, co can't convince your own comrades, then you're, uh, you're, you're a sectarian and you're out in left field. The Marxist Party 
educated in class struggle principles, or the fundamentals of, of Marxism, can correct itself if it makes a mistake, the same as the Russian Bolsheviks did in April 1917. Why was it? Remember, we had, this, we had the class on the history of the Russian Revolution. Why was it that Lenin could come back and the only leader in the whole party, the only national leader in the whole party, take off his coat, lay down an ultimatum to all the leaders that have been in Russia already to control the press of the party? Why is it that he could take off his coat on April 7th and on April 22, have the whole program of theirs reversed, completely reversed? Instead of collaboration with the... With the, with the uh, 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 the bourgeois government that Kamenev and Stalin wanted and, and most all the great leaders of Bolshevism, the ones that were trained directly by Lenin, you might say, they wanted to collaborate with the capitalist class. And how could Lenin come back and in 14, 15 days reverse this whole thing and stand it on its, hip, on its feet? He did it because he educated the rank and file in working class politics. That's why. That's why he could do it. And don't forget that the Bolshevik workers, the Bolshevik workers of Viburg, the suburb of Petersburg, where the working class lived, the workers of Viburg had already revolted against the line of Pravda, which was edited by Stalin and by Kamenev, and which advocated collaboration underneath the board, of course, with the, the uh, or openly with the bourgeois government insofar as insofar as it stood for the revolution. The famous phrase of every opportunist. And that's a very important thing to remember too, if you're in doubt in a factional situation. Like uh, you, we, we, we say we were in 1936. Uh, uh, Cannon wants to sneak us into the socialist colony. Huh? He's gonna sneak me in, that's what I said too. I said that in 1936. And went with Musty. I told you, Cromwell, a couple of weeks ago. Now, what was the correct thing? Go with Ola and into oblivion? Or go with Cannon, where we had been educated in working class politics? Couldn't we have corrected the situation? Of course we could have, if Cannon was going to sneak us in and so forth and so on. The under democratic centralism, the, the individual member in the party can, can retain his or her principles by not making a fool or a pest of himself or herself. How many times have you in a factional situation you'll see uh, like Walford and Robinson, they made, they made a, a fool of themselves. They made a pest of themselves. Uh, one of the comments counted all the internal bulletins that they put out one time, the party put out for these people. I think it was 14 bulletins, wasn't it? Pete Camejo counted them. Now there was uh, an experienced party person reads the first bulletin, sees what they're yakking about. Then, Jesus Christ, he hardly gets through that, out comes another one. Well, he's busy doing party work, trying to build the party. Looks at him, yeah. Before he gets through looking at that, there's another one. Well, uh, right that's time he says, like, Christ, like, these people are screwed. And that's all. He made a pest of himself. You don't make a pest of yourself, you issue your position, you fight for it, and everything will come out in the wash. If you're correct, it'll be proven to worry about it. That's one of the things of life. That's the great thing about politics, as Cannon says, in politics versus religion. Jim says, uh, in religion, you can't prove anything. You can't prove how many angels are dancing on the end of a pin. But in politics, life proves whether you're correct or not. And that's why I say, in the democratic centralism, we can always prove whether we're right or wrong once we state our position. Now, another important thing in regard to Factionalism. I believe this, and it's not meant for any, in, towards any comrades in the movement here. Don't let us kid ourselves. This is very important, comrades. See, they say we live and learn. You don't live. You don't learn for Christ's sake. There's no use fooling around here. But we're in. Uh, we're in serious people. We're serious people, and we're not going to fool around with revolution. On page two thirty, Jim Cannon writes in regard to the actions of Musty protecting his pals down in Youngst in the. Uh, Allentown against the charge that they're collaborating and working underneath the board with the Stalinists. And being urged on by this Aburn, Musty continually gets between the party and his Stalinist friends. Jim says, we try to educate not only the comrades involved in Allentown, but the whole party 
on what conciliation with Stalinism means in a revolutionary sense. But this work was hampered by the fact that these people were personal friends of Musty, and that Musty protected them. For factional reasons, he protected his friends against those who he admitted were defending a correct political line. Instead of taking a clear stand with us and joining with us to put pressure on the Allentown people, he would step in between us and them, blur the issue, and prevent any kind of disciplinary action against the most flagrant violations. Blinded by the intensity of the factional struggle, Musty put the thing on a factional basis, protecting his friends. That is one of the gravest offenses against the Revolutionary Party. What has to be protected in the party, first of all, are the principles of Bolshevism. If one has friends, the best thing he can do for them is to teach them the principles of Bolshevism, not to protect them in their error. If you do that, not only do your friends go to the devil, but you go with them. The friendship business is all right for Tammany Hall, which is based on the exchange of personal favors. But friendship, which is a very good thing in personal life, must always be subordinated to principles and the interests of the movement. The movement. I said to Musty after one of these exhibitions, you are going to be terribly shocked some morning when you wake up and discover a Stalinist nucleus in the Allentown trying to betray the party. And that's exactly what happened. I'm going to give a little instance of this friendship crap. When we, when we, uh, uh, when Shark, when, uh, when Sharkman and, and his tribe uh, uh, quit the movement in 1930, 1940, uh, they maneuvered, you know, they wanted a paper of their own and all this stuff. Sharkman, of course, knew better, but he, he as I say, uh, 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 the power of rationalization is endless. And factionalism is one thing that can make it endless. They, they, they couldn't put out their paper, but they control the, uh, the uh, youth organization, and they use this to peddle their uh, yelling for the blood of the Soviet Union. And I'll never forget it. That night, the first night they put out this goddamn rag in April 1940, my brother comes in the headquarters peddling it. Because this was a challenge to our party. Well, what do you do in this case? Do you say, well, he's my brother? Of course not. He just wrote out the charges right then and there. I said, do you want to hear them or don't you? Doesn't make any difference. You're going to be expelled. Oh, well, we just threw them out like that. Then he passed the paper to someone else and they said, no, I'll buy a paper. I remember Judge, Judge Levan was the organizer. Hey, Judge, write up charges on him too. Right now, right after the other. They just kick them out, snap with a finger. That's, that's, that's a revolutionary uh, action. Well, that's it, comrades.